welcome to the One More Thing podcast. Today I'm joined with Dr. Larry Bauckham. Thanks for being here, man. My pleasure. Yep. You know, it was a kickoff to uh, a new series, Real. Hmm. And you started off, you know, you would almost expect like to start off with like real faith or real, but you started off with real pain. Right. And I think the way you introduced the sermon was one of the most brilliant framings and introductions. You, you had the yeah, right moment. Yeah. And I think it was crucial because the verse you read from James, I know there were folks in the crowd going, yeah, right. Cause you kind of framed it with this idea of when, not if, when pain and suffering and adversity come, you can find joy in that. And immediately, I know people are going, yeah, right. Like, why, why start it that way? Yeah, and I, I think that's the fun, but I mean, that's what it says. So we deal with the text as it is. And I think that's a concept. Uh, there are times in our lives that to be human means to work through things. Mm -hmm. And part of it is pain. But joy is not some sur superfluous um, giddy feeling. It's this uh, deep um, connection within, I think, that lets us know I'm not alone. Yeah. And you were real quick to give a, a, a pretty upfront definition saying joy is not this, like the giddy emotional feeling. It's not happiness, but yet a lot of times, why do, why do we try to wrongly correlate joy and happiness as being one and the same? I, I, that's a good question. And I don't know. I mean, I love to think, you know, I like, to, and I've done this before, which is kind of fun. It's just to look at, okay, now say joy with me, say joy and smile, yeah. <laughs> say joy and smile. Right. And, but, but that word is connected with a lot of smiles and sometimes we confuse its deeper meaning, mm -hmm. I think, which is that uh, for me, it's this, the joy in my life comes from this amazing sense of realization that God is with me regardless. Yeah. And I like the way you, you, you kind of etymologically situated like happiness within happenstance. Mm -hmm. And when you think about it, man, I just, I talked with Esther at lunch about it because she was, she loved the sermon and she says, I never thought of happenstance as happiness because it seems as though it's like, if this happens, then I'm smiley and happy. Right. Whereas joy is like, regardless if this, then on. I'm, uh, you know, and so it kind of gives more of a, a definitive sort of definition of what we're, we're, we're dealing with, with, you know, here. And it goes in, in the face also, I mean, a good teaching of James of just believe whatever you want. As long as my belief structure is okay, I can do whatever I want. And mm -hmm. I think that's a problem. And the, and I, I think the church has, uh, inappropriately taught it's about the creeds and beliefs, and we chant the beliefs, or we sing songs that are, you know, that reinforce this theology that the church has taught. Mm -hmm. But at the end of the day, it's not about uh, I'm in the middle of my pain and there's joy. There's just, you know, sometimes it's hard to sing about that because we don't mention pain. That's uh, right. So when I think of pain, I have certain uh, times in my life I've felt significant pain. Mm -hmm. One was when I lost my brother, and he's 39 years old. I was 29, he's 39. I lost him. And uh, then when my dad passed away and then when my, but I didn't feel it so much for my dad, you know, I mean, he was only 70 years old, but he did not take care of himself mm -hmm. and he was a little more isolated than my brother. And then in 2016, I lost my brother a few years older than me to leukemia and cancer. And we talked every day for years and that was a big loss. Man. But, you know, but suffering, I've had two rotator cuff surgeries. I've had heart surgery. I've had kidney stones. You say, which is it? I say, here's the thing. Did you have joy and all that? I was not giddy. Yeah. Well, maybe some of the medication made me a little giddy. But, but the thing is, God is with me during the whole time. Yeah. And I, I have this, these practices I do that really help me stay centered. That's good. It's, my mom called me this week and her oldest sister um, who lives in Lake Charles, Louisiana. My mom called me and they found out she has stage four cancer. It's all throughout her body. And my mom asked me, like, I'm going to be with her for a couple of days. You know, hospice is going to be there. And so I said, look, mom, the first thing, don't lose hope. Like, but having hope doesn't mean like you're expecting a healing, like this cancer suddenly right. evaporates. Go and bring joy to that situation, like love your sister, be there, encourage her for the next step of her journey, you know? And I think that it's not about going and trying to have this, this mm -hmm. false sense of hope that's grounded in, 
you know, fantasy. And I think I told my mom, you know, watch the sermon this Sunday because this is what it's on. And she texted me and she was like, that that's what I needed to hear. So it's it's applying to my life even right now. Well, Henry, Henry Nowen, the Catholic priest, he wrote a book called The Wounded Healer. And the whole concept of the book is we as clergy or priest or whomever, we step beside those who are going through difficult time mm-hmm. and we are wounded with them. Mm-hmm. And in that relationship of just weeping with them and being with them, it's not what we say. It's not that we perform some miraculous anointing and they're healed. It's simply the presence. We represent the presence of Christ to someone in those difficult times, and we're just there. That's it's, it. It's the ministry of presence, just being there. That's really that's really awesome. And I think one of the things I wish, you know, because you listen to a sermon and we have a certain allotment of time, and there's certain things you hit on yeah. as a master teacher that I go, this you can almost do an entire series just on this. And it's when you talked about the AQ and you differentiated it between intelligent quotient, emotional quotient, and you sort of said something that was striking. And I know that it hit other people. You said the ability to, to have joy while you're experiencing suffering, pain, trials, tribulations, whatever, it's not based upon how much money you make not based upon how smart you are, how many degrees you have. It's not based upon your family upbringing, but that AQ. And I wanted to take some time and one more thing for you to like from your studies on that, man, like that was, where does that come from inside of a person? And is it something that we can practice or train ourselves on in spite of our intelligence or or our emotional intelligence or family upbringing? I think that's a very good question. And, uh, of course, my answers could be across the board. But what I think about is, what is it today that helps me get through my issues of today? And I'll give you an example. When I was in college, I was, uh, you know, I was poor, and I got school grants uh, to be able to even go partial. But I had to work. And I went to work uh, typically on two jobs. I went to work. I had to leave at 2.30 in the morning, get to work at 3 o'clock in the morning, work until 7.30, be in class at 8 o'clock, get out of class at 4 o'clock, and go to my 5 o'clock job and work till 9 o'clock. And I'd hang out socially with, you know, because I'm a young guy and I want to talk to the girls. And But I'd go to bed by 11 and get up at 2.30. Mm-hmm. I did that day after day after day after day. And people said, how can you do that? I go, I don't think about how I do it. I just get up tomorrow and do what I need to do. And some days in our life, it's not like we can forecast right. this stuff. We're in the middle of it. And when you're in the middle of the, you know, the, the old word mire, when you're stuck up to your neck in mud, what do you do? You do the best you can. And sometimes when you look back, you go, my gosh, that was, I can't believe I was able to do that. Mm-hmm. But it taught me some valuable lessons. And part of the lessons is keep on, don't stop, do the best you can. Don't get so caught up in all the things you're doing as if it's some great deal. Just wake up tomorrow and do it again yeah. and do it again. Uh, I come from a family that's very poor and um, I've, you know, I've experienced what it means to be poor, mm-hmm. Same. but we had, we had food to eat always. And uh, we had parents who worked very hard, you know, wasn't, I don't know that I really felt the real loving, you know, affirming all the hugs and kisses and told that you're being loved. But but my mom and dad worked very hard to take care of all our kids. And I appreciate that. But when you look back, you go, wow, wow, that's amazing. But uh, how do you how do you build that adversity quotient or a.k.a. perseverance? Mm-hmm, that's it. You persevere. Yeah. You just keep doing it. And, and then all of a sudden things shift. Life changes. I always found that. If I, if I placed my sight on not necessarily like just the future, like you said, my mom would call me, especially when I was going through my divorce, and she'd call me every day, every day, and just be like, one day at a time. Fix your eyes on the prize one day at a time. Know why you're doing this. Yep. And, you know, I'd always see my kids or, you know, a, a better future. And there were, there were dark times, man, but... I think it's it's always that that's why I think that AQ would be just a really cool even small group oh, would be good to, yeah. to just kind of help people because you see so many people experience pain suffering adversity and they give up right and you it's us as ministers we see greatness in people it's kind of what God's right. called us to do 
And I think this sermon was really inspiring for those people who are on that cusp of like, nothing's going my way. I'm just going to throw in the towel. And I think it gave them like a spark of energy to, to kind of say, I can toughen up. I can persevere. I can find joy. So, Well, Malcolm Gladwell in the book, David and Goliath, it's yeah. an excellent read. I recommend people read it. It's fun to read. It was on the you know New York Times top. 10. I mean, it's been a bestseller, yeah. but he, he tells many stories. One of the stories, and part of David and Goliath, you know, here's Goliath, the giant, you go defeat the, the giant, but we're going to tell you, you got to wear the uniform. You got to do it our way. And he goes, there's no way I can beat the giant that way. But if you let me be myself, <laughs> yeah. I'll find ways to be able to work it out. And then he talks about the guy that invented the chemo cocktail, how that when he was a kid, his mother uh, remarried this guy who was really mean to him. And I mean, so mean to him that it made him tough. And later on, when he went to different medical schools and he's trying these things in a pediat pediatric ward to where kids are dying, they said, look, you just make them feel better. He says, it's not enough. And he stood against the whole medical profession. And and they said, but all the things that gave him the stamina and the, the strength to do that came from that abusive childhood. Mm -hmm. So adversity is that which builds us into people of character. Mm -hmm. And sometimes we don't get it when we're in it. That's right. I mean, we got that. And sometimes when we're done with this, I don't want that AQ. Sorry. <laughs> I'd rather just be naive yeah. and live in my little bubble. But but all those things have a tendency to make us better. That's good, man. Excellent good. sermon. Excellent weekend. Thanks for being with us on One More Thing, Dr. Balcom. Thanks. I appreciate it. Thanks. Awesome.